Hey, my name's Karen. Uh, fantastic to open up this part of God's Word uh, with you this afternoon. Let me pray for us as we come to think about this psalm together. Uh, Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your Word. Your Word is truth. We thank you for the, the truth about your Son uh, who has come to the world uh, to show us the way and to bring us back to you. Lord, we, we pray that you might direct our hearts and minds this afternoon to the great truths about you and your Messiah. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, uh, as Ryan introduced for us, 2020. This is the year that we are in. What a year it's been. And it's not over yet. <laughs> I'm not sure if that, what that brings up for you. Because uh, 2020 was actually meant to be this year, uh, like as the name suggests, of great vision, of great clarity. And yet, what has it been? Utter confusion and chaos. This has been the year that we have been in. Uh, in fact, this is what someone posted at the start of this year between 2019 and 2020 is this meme coming up. Here you go. First rule of 2020, it says, never talk about 2019. As if 2019 was the year to forget. Oh, how little did they know? <laughs> because what has happened in 2020? Well, lots and lots, including things like this. You might remember back to January, we had... And over that, the whole summer, right, the bushfires, then we had the floods, and then the great toilet paper debacle of March and April and whatever it was. But COVID since then has utterly changed our lives, hasn't it? The way that we live, the way that we, we do church as well, the way we do family and work. It's so many different things. Uh, I, I do like this next one coming up though, right? You know, if Chuck Norris, if he had been exposed to coronavirus, then it's the virus that would have to go into quarantine for two weeks, right? If you don't know who Chuck Norris is, then I don't know what the world has come to. If you, if you don't know, check out a Chuck Norris movie, it's great. But we could keep going on with a whole bunch of other things that uh, have happened this year. We could talk about explosions overseas. We could talk about protests, riots, rifts in the royal family, perhaps. A whole bunch of other things as well. And all of these things are even on top of the stuff that's been going in your own world. Things might come to mind to you for what has shaped your 2020 so far. And so well, in all of this, we might naturally ask ourselves like god what are you doing <laughs> you lost control or something what are you doing god where is this all going well our psalm for today psalm 110 it's a fantastic psalm uh, it's though it's written some three thousand years ago it actually gives us a kind of 2020 vision about what god is doing and even though we don't know what the rest of this year is going to look like. Thanks to a psalm like this, we can see where all this is heading without a doubt. So it's going to be a fantastic psalm for us to be working through. So let's look at Psalm 110 together. And we're firstly told that it is a Davidic psalm. So it's written by King David, a thousand years before Jesus. And actually, though, it's actually all about Jesus. Uh, why is that? Because this psalm is all about God's Messiah. Uh, the Messiah was this uh, long for sort of promised king, God's king, who would come and bring about God's purposes in the world. Uh, that's what this psalm is, among many of the other psalms. And so look there at verse 1 with me. This is what David writes as he begins Psalm 110. And this is the declaration of the Lord. Uh, that's God. And notice there where it says Lord in capital letters. Uh, basically where you see that in, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, uh, that's referring to, to God's personal name, Yahweh. Uh, that's how it's often uh, captured in uh, many English transla translations. So this is the declaration of the Lord, the Lord God. To who? To my Lord. And what does he say? Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, wait a second. If, if David is king, and really the greatest king Israel has, has ever known, well, who is he talking to? Who, who's this other figure that, that he, King David, is talking to and that the Lord God is talking to? Uh, well, it's the Messiah. 
And this is what Jesus himself says in uh, Matthew chapter 22. That was our second Bible reading. Uh, Jesus there, he's having this sort of conversation with the Pharisees back and forth, and he asks them a simple question. He says to the Pharisees, whose son will the Messiah be? You know, who, whose descendant will they be? And they, they rightly answer, David, King David. You know, everybody knew that the, the, the Messiah would come from the line of David. But at this point, that's where Jesus drops the bombshell. Because he says, you know what, this one who's going to come from David, he's actually going to be so much greater than David. He's going to be the ultimate king, the eternal king. This is why David calls him Lord, which is a totally out there kind of idea, right? Because in that ancient culture, the, the father was always above the son. And the forefather was always greater than the descendant. And yet here we see how David is calling this Messiah Lord. The Pharisees are totally stumped by this, but Jesus, he knows what this is exactly all about. He knows this exactly about God's eternal king, and he knows actually that's talking about himself. right? Jesus knows that he is the Messiah, the Christ. Uh, and, and by the way, do you realize that those two words, Christ and Messiah, are absolutely the same thing, right? Messiah is the Hebrew word. Christ is the Greek word. But they're, they're, they're talking about the same thing, right? So Jesus Christ equals Jesus the Messiah, all right? Same thing there. And this is what Christians have believed from the very beginning because this is indeed what Jesus knew was true about himself, yeah? And so we could go to a place like uh, Acts chapter 2. This is one of the, the very first sermons preached. Uh, this one's by Peter. So Jesus, it's only been a matter of weeks or days almost since Jesus has risen again. He's then ascended into heaven. Uh, Peter, he preaches this uh, to, the, to the crowds. He says, God has resurrected this Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into the heavens, but it was David himself who says this, quoting Psalm 110, The Lord declared to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this, magi uh, this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Oh yes, Jesus, he is far, far greater than David. In fact, he, he's also far, far greater than even the angels, we're told uh, in the New Testament. Uh, ha have a look at Hebrews chapter 1. So speaking about the Son, Jesus, the Messiah, right? Chapter 1, verse 3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after making purification for sins, that is by his death and resurrection, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And then just a few verses after that, now to which of the angels has he, has God ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? The answer is none. Like, no angel has that sort of rightful place to sit at the, the right hand of God, except, or well, not except, that's reserved for Jesus. And Jesus alone is the one who is enthroned with God on high. And, and this is the thing about the New Testament. It, it keeps on banging on about this, this verse, right? This, this is the one verse from the Old Testament that is quoted more than any other in the New Testament. So it's trying to make a point, isn't it, about Jesus is this Messiah who is at the right hand of God, seated beside him, enthroned on high. Now, when it comes to sitting down, often when I think about sitting down, I, I do that to relax. You know, I pull out a book or uh, watch something on TV. That's, that's how you relax. That's how I like to relax, relax sitting down. The, the thing is, often we can come to think about God this way. We think that God, you know, up on his throne, is relaxed, kicking his feet up, you know, hasn't got a care in the world, not too worried about what's going on. 
That's the exact opposite of what we're seeing here in Psalm 110, isn't it? Like God is profoundly concerned and involved in his world. He there, he's seated on the throne with his Messiah, the Lord Jesus. And at this very moment, right now, God and his Messiah are enthroned and ruling over absolutely everything. Every nation, every person, every year, every day. You know, the sun doesn't rise and we don't take another breath apart from the rule of Christ. Rules over absolutely everything. He notice as well that it's not even uh, something that his enemies can get in the way. Yeah, do you see that also? Uh, even they will be made his footstool. Uh, you, you may have heard of the Roman emperor uh, Valerian. Uh, he's from the 3rd century. And uh, one day he was doing battle against the, the Persians. And he gets captured by the Persian king, uh, Shapur. And, and you know what Shapur does? He, he, he makes uh, Valerian his footstool. This is how um, uh, one artist depicts it. Uh, this is from 1521. And you can see there the, the Persian emperor, Valerian. He's on top with his foot up on the Roman emperor, uh, Valerian. And like, imagine that. The most powerful guy in the whole planet is down in the dust on, on all fours. And there is the new Persian overlord, basically, with his foot up on his back. You know, yeah, you know who's boss, buddy. You know. <laughs> you remember what's happened today. I've been totally victorious. I've smashed you out of the park. This is how it's going to go down. Like He's showing him who's boss, who's calling the shots. And this is also what God has promised his Messiah. It's also something that Paul picks up in his letter to the Colossians. Uh, have a look at chapter 2, verse 15 of Colossians. Talking about the Messiah here, Jesus, and what he's done by the cross, verse 15 he disarmed the rulers and authorities and all the other spiritual powers. And what has he done? He's disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them by him. That's what God has done through his uh, Messiah. He's made a spectacle of them. He's humiliated them by his sheer power and, and, and triumph at the cross. See, this is the great reality is that Christ, he's already absolutely victorious. He's risen again from the grave, and, and, and it's only just a matter of time before every knee will bow before him, willingly or unwillingly. So I hope it's clear, right, that the Messiah's rule is absolutely locked in. And the other thing that we also see here that is locked in is that the Messiah's kingdom will grow. Uh, see verse 2. So it says that, the Lord God will extend your mighty scepter. That's the, the Messiah's mighty scepter from Zion. Okay, so, so while the Messiah there, he's enthroned in this holy city of Zion, his, his rule is actually going to extend out to the whole world. An impressive kind of spread we've got going on there. I, I remember back in um, my primary school at the Oaks Public, and in the school hall you would have the portrait of our queen, right? She's got the, uh, the crown and the... Uh, the, the scepter, her, her kind of rod staff thing that sort of symbolises her rule. Uh, do, do schools still have kind of a portrait of the Queen in, in their hall or something like that? Maybe, maybe not. Well, either way, it, it's, we still have her on all of our coins, right? What's, what's the point of whether it's a portrait in the school or on our coins? It's to, to symbolise that we are under her domain. We are under her, her rule. She has power and, and authority, and uh, this is what God is doing here for his Messiah as well. Everyone's going to know it. Everyone's going to know he, he rules. Everyone's going to know he's victorious. But even on a degree far, far more than you know, Queen Elizabeth, right? Because in many ways, she's just a figurehead. Uh, like her, the, the reality of her power on the ground isn't very much at all. But for Jesus, absolute complete authoritative power but how will we see jesus kingdom grow he's got this power but what's the kingdom going to do well i think it's going to grow by the gospel going out isn't it because it's the gospel of the lord jesus jesus who has died who's risen again 
for the forgiveness of sins, the one who has brought this promise of eternal life, right? that is how people enter the kingdom, isn't it? That's how the kingdom grows. The fact that you, if you call yourself a, a follower of the Lord Jesus, when you enter this kingdom by his grace, that means the kingdom is growing. Like this is how the Messiah's rule is going to go to every land and, and every nation and every street and, and every school as well. Uh, the thing is, though, that Christ's, uh, Christ doesn't just rule over his enemies by subjugation. right? He doesn't just put them in, in their place. right? He, he rules over his enemies by salvation. Yeah? The, the, the way that he actually rules over many of his enemies he, is that he saves them. And, and this is our own story, isn't it? That we were once enemies of God. And yet, by the grace and mercy of our King, we've been brought into his kingdom. Absolutely wonderful news, isn't it? And so now, this changes how we live. You know, as a community of believers, we show to the world what it is to joyfully live under the rule of the Messiah. Like, that, that ought to mean, then, that our lives look different. Now, the way that we are together as a community ought to, to look different. But we're not just to show the world, we're also to go to the world. Uh, do you remember what Jesus says in Matthew 28? So he's just, he's died, he's risen again, he's about to uh, ascend and return to his father. And this is what he says to his disciples there. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth, right? Complete rule, complete power, complete authority over everything. So what's the implication then? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Go to the nations. Don't go with a sword. Go with the word and make disciples. Grow my kingdom because of the fact that I already have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. You see, his kingdom grows through his people bearing his gospel. And as we come to verse 3 from Psalm 110, we see that it continues to speak about the people of the king. Now, let me read verse 3. Your people will volunteer on your day of battle. In holy splendor, from the womb of the dawn, the dew of your youth belongs to you. Clear as mud? You got it? I think this is what's going on here. It's a little bit... Uh, uh, potentially confusing at first, but I think this is what uh, it's talking about. I, I think it's saying that the, the people of the king are not like paid mercenaries. They're not like conscripts enlisted in, uh, into his army against their will. No, no, the Messiah's people can't wait to serve him. They're like putting up his hand, yes, pick me, yes, I'm in, woo! Uh, this is the attitude that the people of the king to have. They can't wait to get into his, uh, into his army. Not that the Messiah needs an army to achieve victory, but boy, does he have one at his disposal. In fact, I think they're described, like they even sort of come out of the woodwork like, like the dew of the morning. Yeah? You, know, you, you know when you walk out first thing and there's like water droplets everywhere? You know, it's kind of like this picture, yeah? It just it covers the ground and... This is what the people of the king are like. They just can't wait. They're ready and raring to serve him. They're different. They're holy. And they have this youthful vigor about them. Why? Because they're serving none other than the king himself. Uh, this is one of the things I find absolutely encouraging. You know, as I, as I look at you and I know you and our other congregations and just other Christians I know, is... Christians, uh, and really no matter what age, but perhaps particularly those older brothers and sisters who have just such a passion for serving their king. They have such a passion. Uh, would you describe yourself as having a passion for serving Jesus? Uh, this is one of the common stories I often hear uh, from, from Christians, particularly if they've been a Christian for uh, some years now. Uh, that They might, as they reflect, go, oh, 
yeah, I, I did have a passion for Jesus. I, I was most passionate and I had most vigor during my younger years as a Christian, if, if you were a Christian then. you know, Maybe it was during my teens or my early 20s, my, maybe even uni years or something like that. But then, you know, as work and career and family and 30s and 40s and 50s, you know, and so on, like, whatever it is, well, that passion has just become a thing of the past. I, I don't know if that's your story, but, like, you know what, where, where, whether it is or whether it isn't, I, we can be on fire for Jesus. Every single one of us, no matter how old you are, no matter how recently you've come to know Christ or, or from years ago, we can be on fire for Jesus because we know, in fact, because God has promised the gospel is going, the kingdom is growing, and Christ, well, right now, he reigns over everything at the Father's right hand. Like, that, that's the reality of right now. Like, we, we don't need to be passionate in order to, to see him reigning at the right hand. No, he already does reign at God's right hand. We don't need to be passionate in one sense to ensure that the kingdom grows. We know that the kingdom already will grow. This is the power of his word uh, through his Holy Spirit. But because we know that God is completely invested in that, that's why we can be passionate for it. Oh, what a joy. What a joy it is to throw yourself into the service of the king who has saved you. Uh, but saved us, saved us how? Well, in verse 4, we'll see that the Messiah, he's not just a king. He's also a priest. Uh, verse 4. The Lord has sworn an oath and will not take it back. Forever you are a priest like Melchizedek. Uh, now, Melchizedek is a bit of a funny character. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him or not. Uh, he's a bit of a funny character in the Bible. Uh, it only pops up a few times. Firstly, in Genesis chapter 14, for just a few verses. And uh, we learn that he's a king, firstly. Uh, he, and his name literally means king of righteousness. That's what Melchizedek means, king of righteousness. The city that he's a king of is also called Salem, which is really Jerusalem in the early days. Okay, And Salem means peace. So this Melchizedek... He, he had this bit of a reputation of being, I guess, a king of righteousness, but also a king of peace. And one of the other really odd factors or, or facts about this Melchizedek is in the book of Genesis, basically anybody who, who is of you know, some significance, what happens? We're, we're given a, their sort of genealogy. We're, we're told who their father is, who their son is, how they fit in with the, the, the family tree or something like that. Not so with this Melchizedek. He just kind of just pops in. Uh, and, and then we don't hear any more. It's kind of like he, he, he just is. He, he doesn't have a, a, a history or a, he, just, he just is. He continues. The thing about this Melchizedek, right, so he's both king and he's a priest. He's a, a priestly king or a kingly priest. He's, he, he's both. He's, he's like a cricketing all-rounder, right? He's, he's got both going for him. So that's from Genesis 14, but then we don't really hear anything about him until our psalm today, Psalm 110, and then not again until the letter to the Hebrews in the, in the New Testament. And so both the, in, in Psalm 110 and, and the letter to the Hebrews, we, we learn, though, that it's the Messiah, it's Jesus, who is like this Melchizedek. Okay, so uh, let's just put that on hold for a moment. Like... Firstly, like a priest. Like, what does a priest do again? Uh, a priest is all about uh, being the, 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 the mediator, the go-between uh, from, from, from God and people, okay? And, and that's really the function that the Old Testament priests would have. Uh, they would offer the sacrifices in the temple, the tabernacle, do a bunch of other stuff on behalf of the people before God. Now, the problem with those priests, though, was that, uh, well... Really, they were just sinners themselves. They were just like everybody else. So really, they, they weren't able to properly mediate between them and, or, or people and God because they themselves needed their own mediator before, people, uh, before themselves and God. They, they were sinners. And the best that they could do when it came to sacrifices, well, they offered animals or, or grain or things like that and had to do it over and over and over again. That was... 
the extent of what they could do. And, and the other thing about these priests from the Old Testament was that they had this really unfortunate habit of, well, dying, which wasn't in their interest. It wasn't in the interest of Israel. And so you can see that there's a lot of issues with the Old Testament priests. Um, not that that was necessarily poor by design, but actually the whole purpose of the priestly system in the Old Testament was to be pointing to something that was to come. And what does Psalm 110 and what does the letter to the Hebrews say was to come? Jesus, the Messiah, the better priest, the perfect priest, the final priest. He's not like these other priests of the Old Testament. If anything, he's like Melchizedek, as he was a, a priest, a, a kingly priest, who seems to have really no beginning or no end. He continues. And Jesus, he doesn't need to offer sacrifices again and again and again. No, no, he offers himself as the perfect sacrifice. Once and for all, he dies in our place. And he's not just a priest for a little while. No, because he rose from the dead, he can now be our great high priest forever. Uh, listen to how uh, the writer to the Hebrews puts it in chapter 7, starting at verse 17. He writes, For it has been testified, and here's Psalm 110 again, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And a few verses later, at uh, verse 22 from Hebrews 7. Next slide, thanks. There we go. Jesus has also become the guarantee of a better covenant. Now, many have become Levitical priests. That's, that's the standard Old Testament priests. Now, many have become Levitical priests since they are prevented by death from remaining in office. But because he, Jesus, remains forever... He holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is always able to save those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. You see, this is why we don't need priests. I, I, I'm not a priest. Luther's not a priest in that way. In, in fact, to, to think that we need priests like that actually denies the very heart of the gospel. The fact that that Jesus has completed everything at the cross. It denies where Jesus is right now at the Father's side. I mean, you can't get any closer to that than what the Messiah or where he is. And I'll tell you what, in, I guess in a year like this year, we've all been looking for assurances. Like we, we just want to know when things are going to ease, when things will stop, when things can start, like things that we can count on. Well, here's one thing that we can count on above all else. It's the, it's the amazing assurance of the gospel that we can always come to God in full assurance and, and, and confidence and faith, not because of some other person, some other priest, some other saint, but completely and only because of Jesus, right? because of what he's done at the cross, or because of where he is right now. That's the assurance that the gospel brings. And when we know that Jesus is our forever priest. So he's our king, he's our priest. And uh, verses 5 to 7, back in Psalm 110, we see what his kingdom's going to be like. And what's his kingdom going to be like? Absolutely victorious. And after his victory... The Messiah enjoys, I think, a kind of victory drink by the brook. I think this is what verse 7 is talking about there. You see, he kind of, he, he's by the, the road, there's a, there's a brook there, he has a drink. I think it's a kind of a victory drink, yeah? You can almost um, picture it like a, like a VB ad, right? VB beer, here you go. Uh, do you remember the old VB ads? I'm not sure if they had them quite these days, but um, if you've watched TV for any length of time, you've probably come across the VB ads and the, the tune and the jingle. There's usually some sort of guy at the end of the day, he's been working hard and he needs to satisfy his hard-earned thirst. He's been, you know, the, 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 the tune usually says something like he's been, you know, you can get it lifting, you can get it shifting, you can get it any old how, right? And then, he, you know, that's, that's how the VB ad goes. I wonder whether this could be the very first VB ad, Yeah. 
You can, you can hear the voiceover as we go through this from verses 5 to 7. And the ad goes, you can get a crushing kings. You can get a judge of nations. And then the camera, it zooms right in, in on the Messiah. He's, he's at the brook by the road. And then it sort of captures his face and he lifts his head and says, matter of fact, I've got it now. There you go. And you've got to have the gravelly voice, right? Because that just makes or breaks the ad, yeah? And I think this is kind of the vibe you get from these verses, is that it's a victory drink that he enjoys. Like you just see from verse 6, right? He, he crushes leaders, the leaders of the world or other leaders who, who've been in opposition to him. It's complete. It's swift. He, and the word for leaders there is actually um, and literally uh, heads, yeah? So... As he has victory over the heads of the world, he himself is able to have his own head lifted in victory. And I think this is talking about that day when God is going to make all things right in the world. All that is wrong, all that is unjust, God's going to make right. It's the day when the Messiah's victory is going to be exercised over everyone and everything and even those things that have been in continual opposition to him and listen to how the the book of revelation uh, puts it john there he's received a vision uh, and and this is how he reports it a similar kind of thing he writes uh, in chapter 19 verse 11 then i saw heaven opened and there was a white horse its rider is called faithful and true, I think speaking about the Messiah there. And what does he do? He judges and makes war in righteousness. His eyes were like a fiery flame and, and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one knows except himself. He wore a robe stained with blood and his name is the Word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses wearing pure white linen. A sharp sword came from his mouth, so that he might strike the nations with it. He will shepherd them with an iron scepter. He will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God, the Almighty. And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Like, whoa. Whoa. Like, where is 2020 going? Where, where is history going? That, that is where history is going. Yeah? And we have to ask ourselves at this point, upon hearing things from like Revelation 19, from Psalm 110, like, do, do you have a sentimental view of Jesus? In this sort of, sort of one-dimensional view of Jesus, right? Where, where that may, maybe it's a weak view, a small view, a domesticated view, where Jesus kind of fits neatly in a, in a box that you like, a, an incomplete view of Jesus. Because the Jesus who came the first time round is the exact same Jesus, the one who's going to come again. And he doesn't have like a personality change halfway through, right? No, he is the very same Jesus standing for the very same things. It, it reminds me of that great C.S. Lewis quote uh, from the, uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, the Lion, the Witch, and the, uh, the Wardrobe. Uh, if you're familiar with it, or, or, or maybe not, but let me give a quick uh, rundown. There's a character, Mr. Beaver, and he's speaking to a girl, Susan, about Aslan. Now, Aslan's kind of like the Christ-like figure in this story, and he, he's the ruler over Narnia, and Aslan also happens to be a lion. And so when Mr. Beaver asks Susan, or tells, he, tells her that Aslan is a lion, Susan replies, oh, I thought he was a man. Is he, is he quite safe? I... You know, I, I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. But then Beaver replies with this, you know, safe? <laughs> Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Like, isn't this, like, doesn't that capture who Jesus is? Like, is he safe? Well, no, no, not when he is the ruling warrior king who has all power and authority. Oh, but he's good, yes, he is good. And this means that there is a sober warning in here for, for us, whether from Revelation 
um, 19 or Psalm 110. Like, there, there is a sober warning for anyone and anything that does not follow Jesus. Do you, do you follow Jesus? <laughs> Because you realise at the same time, I think there's also the invitation, come, come meet and follow this king. Come trust in this priest. Because I tell you what, if you do trust that Jesus, and put your trust in Jesus as your forever priest, then there really is only one safe place, and that is him himself. And boy, is it good to know him as your forever priest. You know, this year, 2020... It's been a fairly uh, disorienting year, hasn't it? But boy, don't we need a Psalm 110 uh, to give us this kind of 2020 vision of what God is indeed doing in our world and what he's doing right now. Like, what has he done? Uh, he, he sent his son, the Messiah, into the world. And he's risen him, he's, uh, he's ascended him to glory, and right now they rule over absolutely everything. That, that is the reality for right now. And boy, what a, a confidence and assurance we have that nothing can stop where it's all going. Nothing can stop his rule being exercised over absolutely everything. Now, the question is for us, do we want to be people of that king? Will you come and follow that king with me, yeah? Uh, let's pray. Our great God, we thank you that you have sent your one and only son, the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, into the world. Thank you that you have granted him victory over sin, over death, over Satan, over all powers by his resurrection from the dead. And Lord, we thank you for the knowledge and the, the, the reality that right now he rules above all. And even though we don't always see what tomorrow is going to be like and next week and the rest of this year and next year, we know the one sure certain fact that he rules over all and that he is our forever priest. Father, help us. Please fill us by your spirit to be people of the king now as we both live in this world, showing the world what it is to live under his rule, but also as we go to the world, declaring the truth that he is the good, good king that we have, uh, that we have to follow. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.